good. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, today, we're very happy to have Edgar Shigulia from University of Pennsylvania uh, give us a talk about the central dogma of cosmological horizons. Thank you so much, Edgar, for accepting and please. Uh, thanks, Nima, and thanks to everyone for having me today, even virtually. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about a combination of these two papers, a paper I wrote late last year, and then a paper I wrote with Lenny Suskind on similar topics earlier this year. The topic is the central dogma and cosmological horizon. So let me review what I mean by the central dogma, in particular, the black hole central dogma. And it's just a statement that a black hole can be thought of as an ordinary quantum system. If you stand outside and look at it, it just evolves like any other quantum system would. And in particular, it has a Hilbert space with A over 4G degrees of freedom, where this area is the area of the event horizon of the black hole, okay? This is an old idea credited to, to, to many people. Here are some uh, subset of people that I, I think were instrumental in um, having this idea emerge. A few years ago, there were calculations of the page curve of Hawking radiation. And one way to think about these, these calculations is that they can be thought of as evidence for the central dogma, okay? Um, the fact that the entropy of the radiation doesn't exceed the area of the black hole suggests that the black hole has this many degrees of freedom. So you can think of it as evidence for the central dogma. Okay, accelerating cosmologies also have event horizons, and those event horizons also have an entropy. It's called the Gibbons-Hawking entropy because Gibbons and Hawking were the first ones to write it down. And that formula is the area of the event horizon divided by 4G Newton. So it's natural to ask, do accelerating cosmologies obey some sort of central dogma? Okay, this uh, was first proposed by, by these authors almost 20 years ago now. And it's... Um, well, it's much uh, wilder of a conjecture in this case, which we'll get to in a moment. And in this talk, I'm really gonna focus just on the simplest accelerating cosmology, uh, de Sitter space-time, the uh, simplest in a certain sense. So here is the metric of de Sitter space-time. For those that don't work on de Sitter or haven't thought about it in a while, it of course looks a lot like the ADS metric, except these are minus signs here instead of plus signs. And this is a particular coordinatization. It's called the static patch metric. So it covers a part of the full, uh, the full space time and it can be analytically continued into the other regions that we care about. But these coordinates are nice because they manifest the event horizon. If you look at R equals L, this GTT component is going to zero. So there is an event horizon there. And this is the formula I just said from before, there's an entropy associated to this event horizon given by its area divided by four G Newton. And there's a temperature similar to black holes uh, of this event horizon given by this formula here. Okay, so it seems a little bit similar. Let me provide several warnings and I'll spend a few minutes talking about these because I think it's, it's interesting to, to remember the ways in which accelerating cosmologies are or are not similar to, to black holes. So the first uh, caveat in trying to think of a central dogma for accelerating cosmologies is that there's very little uh, if any, agreed upon microscopic support for the Gibbons-Hawking entropy. What do I mean by this? Well, these entropies, either for a black hole or for cosmologies, they're thermodynamic things, okay? And uh, you need someone like Boltzmann to come along and tell you what this thermodynamic ent entropy corresponds to in, in terms of some microscopic constituents in a Hilbert space. Now, for some special black holes, in string theory, we've understood what these uh, sort of microstates are, at least in some you know, regime of couplings. But in cosmology, we don't really have any examples where we've uh, been able to ascribe microstates or microscopic configurations that reproduce the entropy of a cosmological horizon. There are some scattered calculations trying to get close to it, but I think it's fair to say there's no you know, universally agreed upon example where this is understood. Um, a related thing is that the zero point entropy is difficult to interpret in the case of cosmologies. So what do I mean by this? Well, you can get pretty close to the formula S equals area over 4G Newton, just by doing a kind of thermodynamics. You, you know, drop a particle past the horizon, you see how the horizon reacts and you get the thermodynamic laws, D equals TDS, where S corresponds to the area of the horizon. That of course is a differential relationship. It doesn't fix the zero point of the entropy, 
In the case of a black hole, it's pretty natural to say once the black hole you know, evaporates and is completely gone, uh, in other words, once the size of it is zero size, the entropy should be zero. But for cosmic horizon, it's a little bit weirder. That limit of the vanishing cosmic horizon is, is a little funny. Okay, it's not clear how to think about it. Finally, well, not finally, sorry. <laughs> the third thing is, um, you know, black hole horizons, a la, you know, the holography of uh, Tuft or, or, or Susskind, they're thought of as encoding the interior. You imagine some degrees of freedoms, on, the degrees of freedom on the event horizon, and that's supposed to be the holographic screen that encodes the interior of the black hole that doesn't encode the exterior. But how does it work for cosmological horizon? It's natural to say again that the cosmological horizon encodes what's beyond it. But if you want some sort of holographic description, uh, what encodes then the interior of the cosmological horizon? It really has two sides that sort of need to be encoded by something. Uh, this point we're going to address a lot more in this talk. Another thing is that the cosmological horizon is both more universal and more observer dependent than the black hole horizon. I say it's more universal because it just comes to you with the theory. The theory itself, any sort of solution you write down for Einstein gravity, the positive cosmological constant, you know, it's going to ask them to, to, to consider space time and you're going to have these event horizons. Black holes, on the other hand, we think of them as excited states on top of an otherwise vacuum without event horizons in it. So in that sense, the horizon is more universal. It's more observer dependent because there's an infinity of different observers in Dissiter spacetime who have different event horizons. Whereas in the case of a black hole, unless you jump into it, you and your friend are going to agree about the black hole event horizon. Okay. A technical point, which was important in the computations of the page curve, is that there's no asymptotic region at a fixed time where gravity is weak in the case of Dissiter spacetime. The spatial slices are closed. So there's no you know, place to go where you say gravity gets weak, and then you can use the sort of technical tricks that were used in that context. In particular, the back reaction is always important. And then there's this uh, statement here, which I put in bold because uh, I'm particularly interested in this. And um, hopefully, we'll have a, a paper appear about it in a few weeks with Adam Levine, uh, which is this issue of overlapping islands. So th this comment will maybe be for, for the experts. But in the black hole case, you know, we've learned that there's, uh, if you collect, if you stay outside and collect the Hawking radiation, then you can encode what's in the interior of the black hole in a region called an island. And the thing that you would want to do in cosmology is to somehow say the same thing. You stay in here inside your, you know, comfortable cosmic horizon, you collect some data, uh, maybe it's the Hawking radiation from the cosmic horizon, maybe it's something else, and you're able to encode what's beyond your cosmic horizon. That's what we would like to say. And in some cases, something like that is true. But if that were to be true, it's a bit problematic because you can encode what's beyond your cosmic horizon. Someone else somewhere else in the universe would say the same thing, that they could encode what's beyond their cosmic horizon. But those regions overlap. So you both will be encoding the same region of space time. That's something that doesn't happen in the black hole case. It doesn't happen in, uh, in holography. And it can lead to problems with the no cloning theorem. So I, I think this is another you know, it's um, a sharp thing that would be different in the case of cosmologies. But okay, I've sort of aired my dirty laundry and there are more things that people can complain about. Often when I give this talk, people add their favorite complaints about trying to apply black hole stuff to cosmology. But since I've aired my dirty laundry, I'm allowed to ignore all of it and proceed and see what happens. Yeah, awesome. Nima. Uh, so in this analogy that you're making with black hole, I, I would have thought it would be more natural to say the uh, cosmology is like inside the black hole. So we say that the inside of the black hole is encoded outside. So the, what, what the observer, cosmological observer sees could be reconstructed outside. And I mean, in this sense, you know, inside of the black hole, gravity is never really weak, right? Not necessarily. So is it, isn't that more natural to say the other way, say the other way around? Um, yeah, that, that's natural. The, the interior of a black hole is a lot like a cosmology. It's like a crunching cosmology. But here I'm sort of like, I'm trying to aim for something even higher or even better. Because if we, if we subscribe to that, then we'd have to subscribe to the idea that, yeah, it's like we're in the interior of a black hole and someone else is encoding us. But what I would like to understand is us encoding someone else. I want to see if that's possible. It's a higher bar. 
the thing that you said, I think is true. You can write down examples where things like that are, are, are true. Uh, but I want to see if the even stronger statement of us encoding stuff beyond our cosmic horizon could possibly be true. I guess I was saying that would, would you agree with the statement that the island story is suggesting the at least is, is more analogous to what I was saying, right? This what you're going for is beyond the island story. Is that right? Or am I, am I missing? Uh, yeah, I, it's, it's a bit of a matter of taste. I mean, if I just say we've learned that islands encode what's beyond the horizon, then I'm building an exact analogy. While we have a cosmic horizon, we can ask, is there an island beyond that cosmic horizon that we can encode? Um, it, okay, it's just okay. a kind of matter of how you spin it. But I, I, I agree with you that the, um, it's, a, it's a more, what you said is a more precise connection. And if I have time in the discussion, we could talk about examples that realize that more precise connection. Okay. So let, let me proceed with the analogy. So here we have the eternal ADS black hole. Here's the past and future singularities. Uh, these are the ADS boundaries. Here's one of them, here's the other one. And it hasn't escaped anybody who's thought about the sitter space that at least the causal structure of the space time is identical to that of the sitter space time. Okay, the Penrose diagrams are both squares. In this case, these aren't these vertical lines at the edges aren't boundaries. Uh, space time just ends here because the time slices are spatial spheres in the sitter space, okay? So the causal structures are similar. The geometry is, of course, very different. And now let's go back to the left column. In the computations of the page curve, one of the simple examples um, modified the space-time in a particular way. It added these flat space regions. I put them in gray because you, you know, it's assumed that gravity, the gravitational effects can be ignored in this region. The reason for that is gravity is getting very, very weak as you push the ADS boundary. And then you glue on this flat space region where you just assume that gravity can be totally ignored. And that allows you to do computations a little bit more cleanly. Now, we can't quite glue without having some non-trivial solution of flat space region here. Like I said, this is not really a boundary of space time, but I'm gonna do something a little crazy I'm just going to carve out some arbitrary region at some finite radius and say that I'm going to ignore the effects of gravity in these regions. Okay? This is meant to mock up a potentially more complete construction where you might embed the sitter space in asymptotic ADS or asymptotic flat space. The details are not going to be particularly important. I think we're going to sort of eventually learn a valuable lesson from, from this model, and then we're going to ditch it. So um, if you're worried about this thing about freezing gravity, um, maybe just wait a little bit. I don't think it's going to play a, an important role. So one thing I always like to do when computing entropies, which is what we're going to do, is uh, have some idea of what the microscopic picture is so that I don't confuse myself about what entropy I'm calculating. Here, we have a pretty, pretty sharp statement about the microscopic picture. It's just a holographic dual of this. Okay, here we have, you know, the examples were two dimensional. So you have a two dimensional ADS space time here with two dimensional flat space regions here. And you have a 2D CFT that lives everywhere in this space time. Okay. So the dual of that, you imagine taking the duals uh, that describe this gravitational system here. Since we're in two dimensions, they're one dimensional. It's often called a quantum dot or an SYK dot. And it's coupled to a semi infinite bat where a 2D CFT lives and it interacts with the 2D CFT. And it has its thermal field double partner, which is this um, region here. Okay, that's the quantum state that they're in. Now on the right column, okay, who knows what the holographic dual here is, but we're trying to do analogous computations. The analogous thing you would write down is another sort of set of quantum dots. The computations I'll be doing will be in general dimensions, so they can be higher dimensional quantum systems. Now the CFT it interacts with is not on a semi-infinite line, it's on some finite interval. And it's in some state, maybe something like a thermal field double state, but I'm not gonna make any assumptions about what sort of state it's in. And we want to ask, similar to over here, where we learned from the page curve computations that the gray regions can probe what's beyond the horizon, is something like that true over here? Okay, that's the question we'd like to ask. So let me tell you exactly what we're gonna try and calculate, both from the microscopic point of view and from the bulk point of view. From the microscopic point of view, we're gonna imagine computing the entropy of one of the two quantum systems, plus maybe a little bit of the, um, what's called the bath region. 
Okay, we want to compute that microscopic entropy. In bulk language, what that means is because we've included this quantum system, in the bulk picture, the endpoint lives in the sort of gravitating space time, and we need to extremize the endpoint. Okay, this is like a fancy version of the Ryu Takanagi formula. Uh, I'll do it with quantum corrections. But when I say we want to extremize the left endpoint, what I mean is we want to extremize the generalized entropy functional, which is the function I've written here. That's just the gravitational entropy, which means the area of this point here. Now, there's a Penrose diagram. So if we're in you know, four dimensions, let's say, there's a two sphere hiding at every point here. So when I say this point, there's a two sphere of a particular area that's sitting there. So the gravitational entropy term is that area divided by 4G Newton. And the matter entropy is the entropy on this interval here. That's called the generalized entropy. That's the thing I want to extremize with respect to this endpoint R. Okay. I haven't told you yet what quantum state I'm in. I'm going to work in the Hartle Hawking state. Okay. Now, this is, of course, hard to do. The reason why in the ADS computations, uh, we worked in two dimensions was because in two dimensions, you have a lot of control over the matter entropy. If you have a 2D CFT, we have some nice universal formulas for the 2D CFT entropy of some interval. In higher dimensions, those formulas are harder to come by, especially in non-trivial states. But to make the point I wanna make, I'm not gonna need an explicit formula for the matter entropy, okay? If I assume that I have a CFT living here, then I can just use uh, conformal invariance. In particular, it's a famous fact that the sitter space, if you continue to Euclidean signature, is a sphere. And the sphere is conformally related to the plane. One way to see that is the ordinary stereographic projection, which we all learned, uh, I don't know how long ago. But you sort of project the subspheres of this sphere onto the plane uh, stereographically. Here is a head-on view of what that looks like. It just radially foliates the plane. This is the kind of canonical thing you see if you, for example, looked up stereographic projection in Wikipedia. But there's another way you can stereographically project. Instead of going from like the south pole of the sphere to the north pole of the sphere, you can go from the west pole of the sphere to the east pole of the sphere. And that will foliate your plane in this other way, which in a head-on view kind of looks like an owl. Um, why do I want to do this? It's just to connect to some formulas I want to do this because if I use a combination of these two stereographic projections in projecting the sphere onto the plane, then I can show that the region at t equals 0, any region at t equals 0 whose entropy I want to compute, will actually map to an annular region in the plane. And by annular, I mean the region between two spheres if I'm in general dimension. If I'm in you know, two dimensions, it's really an annulus, the region between two circles. Um, but in general, it's the region between two spheres. And there, there have been some nice constraints that are written down. We know a lot about those entropies. We don't, you know, we can't compute them exactly for general theories, but strong subadditivity gives us some derivative constraints on the entropies. S not here, uh, by this, I just mean the finite piece of the entropy. So I'm ignoring UV divergent terms, and I'm just talking about uh, derivatives of the finite piece of the entropy. So we have these derivative constraints and we know more. We, so R here, sorry, I should have said this. R here is like the ratio of the two radii of the spheres that we're talking about. So when R is getting large over here, then the annular region is getting very thick. The spheres are getting very far apart. In that limit, the computation effectively factorizes into the entropy of two independent spheres. Uh, conventionally, that's called minus F, the uh, entropy of a sphere. So if you have two of them, you get minus 2f. So we know what it is in this limit. We also know what it is in the limit when the two spheres come close together. At least we know how, how it scales. You can basically approximate it as a parallel plate capacitor in that thin annular limit. And then it diverges um, in this way with a minus sign. Okay. All this is to say that we have good control over the first derivative of the matter entropy. It starts off at infinity for a very, very thin annular region. And as you increase it and make it thick, it monotonically decreases to zero. Uh, sorry, Edgar. I have yeah. a question. 
So I'm a little bit perplexed by this statement. So it, uh, as you mentioned, the annulus for, uh, partition function that you're interested in, or the annulus calculation that you, you want to do, it's non-universal, right? But I, I don't understand how this is different from the ADS case. ADS case is also basically very similar in spirit, right? It's, you're going to get a non-universal answer. And I think you, you will probably, there will be analogous statements and ADS analogous to this, what you were saying here. Because what, what you're getting here, the, the two limits so far you've mentioned, right? One of them is sort of cluster, clustering, right? Yeah. And there will be an analogous statement over there, right? Am, am, I, am I missing something or? Um, I'm not exactly sure what computation you're imagining doing in the ADS case. It, it's, yeah. I mean, the important thing I wanted to use here, and there are analogs to this in the ADS case, is to use strong subadditivity to say something about the derivatives. That's going to be a, part, a key thing. The calculation I was imagining was the uh, hard dimensional version of uh, the island store. OK. But actually, maybe maybe we, we can put that aside. I have a little bit of a different question. So this, this S0 becoming minus 2F, right? That yeah. is based on the fact that you're assuming that uh, it's something like a cluster, right? You want to say yeah. you're yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like clustering. But how do you know that in this, after a whole bunch of conformal transformations, in this limit, things cluster? Because you have you have applied conformal transformations that have taken things that used to be very close to now they are very, very far apart. So yeah, I do the conformal transformations, and then I land on a generically sized um, annular region in the plane. And then I take the limit of them being far apart. So I think this is the appropriate conformal frame in which you want to judge how far apart things are. Like if I'm in three dimensions, for example, I don't have to worry about any anomalies or anything like that. Um, I think you know th this is exactly what you want to do in this frame. I see. So you're saying that just twice of F term. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So we have this control over the first derivative. And that's going to be enough to roughly locate where the um, extremal surface is. And in particular, it locates it in the left region. The reason for that is we know how the area term behaves, the gravitational entropy term. That thing's derivative vanishes over here because this is a classical extremal surface. And then it um, goes negative as you push the point to the left. However, I said that the first order of the matter entropy starts off at plus infinity and goes to zero as you push it to the right, make the annulus um, thinner. And so at some point, those two things are going to be equal and opposite, and you're going to find an extremum. It's going to be somewhere in this left region. Okay. That's basically the argument. If it seems a little uh, quick or abstract, or if you're worried about it, you can explicitly compute this and check in a toy model. Uh, the toy model is considering Jakeeb Teitelboim gravity in two dimensions with a positive cosmological constant. Okay, that has as a solution two dimensional de Sitter space. In that case, you can explicitly solve for R1. You can write down a function for it, not just argue that it's somewhere here. And it lives in the left region. Okay, so we found an extremum, but this extremum is bad, okay? <laughs> It's bad because remember, we're trying to connect to a holographic type picture. And in a holographic type picture, one of the basic things that we like to have is something called entanglement wedge nesting. Entanglement wedge nesting uh, uses a few ideas. First of all, use the idea that whatever this region is, you're encoding this region in your microscopic holographically dual description. Okay, that's what that's a statement of entanglement wedge reconstruction. And you're, you're encoding it in exactly the microscopic thing you're probing. And you're encoding it in this piece of the microscopic description. So if you assume that, then there's just a, log a consistency constraint, which says that if I probe more of the, my microscopic description, in other words, if I push this endpoint to the right, and I access more of the degrees of freedom of my microscopic description, I should access more of the bulk. Okay, that's just the, like a logical <laughs> constraint. It's not even really physics. Um, but that doesn't happen here. If I push this point R2 to the right, this point R1 gets pushed to the right as well. That violates entanglement wedge nesting. 
Okay. So we seem to conclude that the use of this extremal surface, which is a close cousin of this De Sitter's bifurcate horizon, this classical extremal surface, you can imagine quantum corrections are small. And then, you know, the extremum is just going to be slightly offset from this point by a little bit. Uh, the use of this surface seems prohibited. Okay, it's actually very different than the black hole bifurcate horizon. Uh, why is that? It's because geometrically, it's actually, uh, it, it, it is very, it's obviously different. So the Ryu Take and Nagi or quantum extremal surfaces we like to use in ADS CFT or other examples of holography, uh, they're what we call maxi min surfaces. Okay, there's some prescription you can write down, but basically it means that they're a minimum in space and they're a maximum in time, roughly speaking. So we call them maxi min. This surface is not a maxi min surface, it's a mini max surface. Okay, that's simplest to see by thinking about the classical limit where we're just talking about this DS bifurcate horizon. Remember, De Sitter space is some space time that's infinitely big in the past. It sort of uh, comes to some smallest size waste at t equals zero, and then it grows again. So at t equals zero, it's a minimum. Okay, so it's a minimum in time. And then it's a maximum in space because it's, you know, it's the cosmic horizon out there. It's like the equator of, or it's like a great circle on the sphere. So it's, it's true, it's an extremal surface, but its nature is different than the ones that we always use for entanglement entropy computations. And its nature means that you're gonna have these weird things. If you try to interpret it as computing an entanglement entropy, you're gonna violate nesting, okay? Now, okay, so we can't really use this surface. So what's the answer to the question of what is the entanglement entropy? Okay, well, the answer is a bit trivial in this case. Um, the true quantum extremal surface, you know, if you actually tried to minimize the entropy instead of maximizing it, which is apparently what, what happened here, then this point's just gonna wanna try and shrink off and run off uh, and vanish. It can't you know, totally shrink off and vanish because of these boundary conditions where we freeze gravity. So this extremum is gonna live right at this cutoff. That's a sort of degenerate answer. It's an uninteresting answer, but in a sense, in this example, it's the right answer. It's not useful because this cutoff was totally arbitrary. If I change it, then I would change the answer for the entropy. Um, but in any case, the main lesson uh, of, of this example is that if you sort of try and use the cosmic horizon in the way you might use the black hole horizon by doing sort of holographic computations from some region where you're far away and looking at it, uh, you're not, it's gonna fail. It's not gonna work uh, because, of, because of this reason. So that's, that's the first lesson of how not to use the cosmic horizon. And the second part of my talk is gonna be a proposal for how to use the cosmic horizon. But before I move on, I'll just stop to see if there are any questions. Okay, so uh, we would still like to use the cosmic horizon and its area and have it enter into some entropy computation, okay? Because we believe that that given talking entropy is sort of meaningful, should be computing an entanglement entropy and maybe enter into computations like black hole entropies enter in, in ADS CFT. So the proposal is gonna be now we're not gonna freeze gravity in some region, you know, in the interior or anything like that. The proposal is gonna be that we're going to anchor our extremal surfaces to the horizon itself. So in particular, what this means is that we're gonna think that the pair of cosmic horizons are where the holographic dual theory lives. Okay, this is a, a, an old idea. There's sort of support for it by looking at holographic screens in space times and seeing that the cosmic horizons can act as holographic screens. But I won't really get into all that. I'll just state it as, as, a, as a guess or a proposal, which is that the holographic dual theories live there. And therefore, we should anchor extremal surfaces to the horizon itself. Okay. In terms of entanglement entropy computations, uh, this was explored in some way by these authors. The particular proposals I'll be talking about here are different than, than, than these ones. But the very first question that comes up is what we discussed at the beginning of the talk, which is there's space time to both sides of the cosmic horizon. So which side of the cosmic horizon are you supposed to anchor your surfaces to? Do you anchor it to the interior side, the exterior side, both? Um, that's a natural question to ask. In ADS-CFT, we never face this question, or uh, we don't usually face this question because we only have space time to one side of the ADS boundary. 
So it's clear where we put our extremal surfaces. Okay, this, this part of the question I think is a bit of a red herring. There's an example in ADS CFT, which ends up being the same where you have space time to both sides of the ADS boundary. So let's, let's work through that example. Here again, I have the thermal field double or the eternal ADS black hole with the flat space regions that you glue on. And I have the microscopic description that we already discussed. And here I have, uh, for people who know it or like to see it, the doubly holographic representation where with an end of the world brain and a D plus one dimensional ADS space time, you can ignore this right hand column. It's not going to be important for what I wanna say, but in case you're familiar with it, uh, I'm just drawing them here. There's a simple modification you can make to, to this model. Instead of having a semi-infinite region where gravity is shut off, you can make that region finite. You can make it finite and add to the other side another uh, eternal ADS black hole. Okay, now this Penrose diagram is identified along these vertical lines. So it has the topology of a circle. And the microscopic description here is you still have your original quantum systems and the baths, which were in a thermal field double, but the baths are now cut off. They're cut off by another quantum system. It's blue to represent, you know, the quantum system being dual to this blue region in the bulk. And so you have this uh, two quantum systems interacting through a bath in a thermal field double state. Okay. Now, of course, it's easy to see uh, how to modify this example. You can shrink this gray region to zero size. You can shrink it to zero size. Let's start off in the microscopic description. This bath vanishes. The red sits on top of the blue and gives you purple. So you just have some self-interacting quantum system. It's still in the thermal field double state with a purifying partner. And the bulk description has that gray region shrinking to zero size. And now, it looks a lot more like an ordinary ADS boundary. It's an ordinary ADS boundary, but now it has space time to both sides of it, okay? In this context, in the doubly holographic picture, this is sometimes called the wedge holography. Um, but in any case, it's a situation where you have an ADS boundary with space time to both sides. And it's analogous to what we face in the De Sitter case where you have a cosmic horizon with space time to both sides. Okay, and we know what the answer is here. Um, at least one, one reasonable way to formulate uh, the questions is, let's say this purple system is some uh, D-dimensional quantum system, and you wanna compute the entropy, you, let's say you put it on a spatial sphere, and you wanna compute the entropy between two halves of the sphere, okay? Well, here you have the crutch of being able to regulate it, um, but a natural way to formulate the computation is in the regulated picture, you pick half the spatial sphere on the blue guy, half the spatial sphere on the red guy, and continue it some way in the bath. And then you take a limit as it goes to zero size. And that lands you on the computation you want. But in this picture, since you picked half of the blue spatial sphere and half of the red spatial sphere, um, what you need to do is find an extremal surface in the red region anchored to that sphere and an extremal surface in the blue region anchored to that half sphere. That's just the answer for, for what you should do. So when you take this limit, you're gonna to have to find extremal surfaces on both sides. Uh, so, sorry, Edgar, I'm a little confused about the, uh, the, the drawing. So in the, in the uh, two ADS case, is the left farmost line identified? Is this topologically, uh, the Cauchy slide is the sphere? Yeah. Then why do you yeah. draw that? The, you, you draw two uh, intervals as a thermal field double. Here? Be just one blue line if they're identified. The, so the blue dots correspond to the quantum system that lives at this boundary and it's thermal field double, which lives at this boundary. Right, but sorry, here red means uh, they're, they're related to the ADSD inside. Yeah. Then wouldn't you, oh, wait, sorry. Okay, okay, no, no, I understand, I understand. Good, 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 I get it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so, so he, here we know, we know what the answer is. And I want to use that to say, well, that's what the answer should be in the De Sitter case as well. So let's go to the De Sitter case. As I said, the proposal is that the microscopic theory or the holographic theory lives on the pair of cosmic horizons. You know, here's one cosmic horizon, there's another one. So for example, imagine taking a global time slice that just cuts across like this. 
The spatial geometry of that slice looks like this. You have an exterior region, which is the region in this upper triangle, and you have these two interior regions, and they're split by the left and right horizons. For the computations, it's going to be a little useful um, to imagine breaking them up, uh, breaking up these things into three regions. Okay. So now I can state the proposal for computing entanglement entropy, and I'm going to state two proposals. The way I motivated it was uh, how I like to think about what, of how to compute the entropy in this situation, which, as I said, you extremize on both sides of the horizon. In the paper with uh, Lenny Suskind, we call that the bilayer proposal. Lenny's proposal was that instead of extremizing on both sides of the horizon, you should only extremize in between the horizons, okay? And we call that the monolayer proposal. The reason for the names is that if you do a bit thread formulation of entanglement entropy, it's the statement of whether bit threads are emitted only into the exterior region or into both regions. So is it one layer emitting bit threads or is it two layers emitting bit threads? But they're, they're just some names. We're gonna move on to compare these proposals in a second. But first I want to say one thing that I like about the bilayer proposal is that there's a natural notion of entanglement wedge here. Because you find a surface here and a surface here, together they form some you know, closed kind of region of space time. And so there's a natural notion of entanglement wedge. And so if the ideas of entanglement wedge reconstruction, et cetera, can be ported over to this case, there's a natural extension. Um, there's a natural way to state all that in the bilayer case. In particular, I'm only gonna be talking about classical computations from here on out. But the fact that there's a natural notion of entanglement wedge means there's a natural quantum extremal surface extension of, of the proposal. But I'm not going to really say uh, much about that. I'm going to do classical computations. So I think this, these proposals will become a little simpler if we do some examples. That's what we're going to turn to now. So let's do some examples. OK, we have global de Sitter space. It's in you know, the hartle hawking state. And the first thing we want to compute is the simplest thing. It's the entropy of the union uh, of the two horizons. So this is the entropy of the full microscopic theory. Uh, this should give you zero. Okay, It's a little analogous to computing the entropy of the CFT that lives at this boundary, union the CFT that lives at this boundary. That entropy is zero. You should only get a finite entropy if you consider one of the two boundaries. Okay, And that's what we find. How do we see that? Well, let's do the extremizations. Uh, we have a region on the left horizon that we want to uh, find an extremal surface for. But we, since we've considered the entire horizon, the trivial surface is a valid extremal surface. If you want to think about it dynamically, you sort of start off with a little circle that's sitting at this left horizon. You extremize in this direction. And then it just kind of shrinks and slips off and vanishes, giving you zero area. Okay. Same thing happens if you extremize to the interior of the right horizon. The surface shrinks and slips off and gives you zero area. And for the region in between the two horizons, OK, you have two circles now. You should think of them as, in a sense, oppositely oriented, such that they can come together and annihilate. Okay, This is just a dynamical way of stating it. You can just as easily say that the trivial surface is a valid extremal surface because it satisfies the homology constraint of you know, finding the, these such surfaces. And the trivial surface has zero area. Therefore, the entropy is zero. And the entanglement wedge is the entire space time. Sorry, was there a question? Yeah, yeah. I, I got confused. So you had two different uh, setups. You had the, the one that you were extremizing to outside, and then the one that you were extremizing to the middle part. You're saying that it, the answer is zero in both cases? Uh, yeah, so sorry, right, just, just to make sure it's good. Right now, I'm doing this bilayer type thing where I have oh, to. Oh, you're just doing the bilayer. OK, OK. Yeah. Yeah, we have to do both extremizations. And the extremization in between gives zero, and the extremization on the outside gives zero. This is just the bilayer statement so far. Okay, okay. sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I, sh I, I should have said that. Um, okay, that was uh, that's good. That's the expected answer, but that's maybe a little too simple. Let's see if we can get the right answer if we compute the entropy of one of the two horizons. Okay, this is the sense in which the sitter space is supposed to have an entropy. The global state is not believed. Or the, you know, we don't believe that the entropy is relevant for the global system. We believe that that comes from tracing out stuff beyond the cosmic horizon. And if we consider just one of the two horizons, that's the sort of thing we should be landing on. And if we do the, if we compute with the bilayer proposal, we find that that's the case. 
we first extremize to the left interior region. Again, the circle here is allowed to shrink and slip off and give you zero size and zero area. So that doesn't contribute. But now when you extremize to the exterior, it's not gonna wanna go anywhere because the area is larger out here. It's just gonna sit right here on the cosmic horizon. Because it's gonna sit right there on the cosmic horizon, the entropy is gonna be the area of the cosmic horizon divided by four G Newton. Okay, that's of course the answer we want. This is the Gibbons Hawking entropy. And the entanglement wedge now is the interior, is the left interior. That's also what we want. The left horizon shouldn't by itself know about what's going on beyond it. It should sort of only know what's going on in the interior, or that's at least one way to think about it. Sorry, Arnold, but can you make the HR smaller so that we like to go to the right? That's a great question. Uh, you can ask me that again at the end of the talk. That, yeah, you can ask me that at the end of the talk. In this case where they're exactly degenerate, the rule is you always choose this one. There's so much situation in ADS CFT. The only way to disentangle them is to argue for what the reconstructable region should be. And in that case, you should pick this one. There are situations, uh, maybe I'll just address it now, where you can make the HR one smaller, but they're sort of funny. Um, they're well, the slightly asymmetric things. I mean, most solutions that we write down and think about uh, kind of compress both of them in the same way. We'll see an example of the Schwarzschild black hole, for example, uh, in a few slides. The horizons change, but they um, one of them doesn't get smaller than the other one. If it does, then yeah, it can move over to the right. That can happen. Um, but for pure de Sitter, they're equal size. OK. The other thing I want to emphasize is that we recovered the horizon area, but we have to be careful uh, from the lesson in the first part of the talk, whether this is like a valid uh, extremal surface. And in fact, it is now a maximum surface. There's a way to phrase this extremization where you basically pin the regions on the horizon you care about and consider Cauchy slices, which intersect those pinned regions and otherwise can move around. And you can do a maximum prescription on those Cauchy slices. And so you can recover this surface as a valid maximum surface. So in any example I know about, there's no violation of entanglement wedge nesting or anything like that. I think it's effectively guaranteed by the fact that the horizon is a holographic screen. Although because of the exterior extremization where something slightly funny is going on, I'm not sure it's like a total theorem. Okay, so that was the bilayer proposal. What does the monolayer proposal gives you? Well, it gives the same answer as far as the entropies are concerned. The reason for that is every time I extremize to the interior, I just got zero, both in this the first computation and in the second computation. So numerically, the interior extremization didn't change the answer at all. The full answer, if there was one at all, came from the exterior extremization. So the two proposals give the same answer. OK. Let's try and do a slightly more involved example. This was just pure de Sitter. Let's consider Schwarzschild de Sitter. Okay, the uh, metric looks like. Is there a question? Yeah, but uh, from the last slide, if you take only the subset of HL, would the both answer be the same between monolayer and? Great question. We'll get there in like two slides. Yeah, yeah, the answer is they won't be the same, but we'll get there. You ruined my punchline, who is here? <laughs> um, OK, so uh, let's consider the Schwarzschild black hole in the sitter. Here's the metric. It looks just like the ADS Schwarzschild black hole, except again, these are minus signs and not plus signs. And the Penrose diagram looks like this. I mean, it has some insane maximal analytic extension, but you can cut it off and periodically identify so that it looks like this. Here's the black hole region. Here's the inflating region. Let's look at a time slice of this geometry, because it was identified, it has this kind of topology. And now let's imagine computing the entropy of the left horizon again. The exterior extremization is not really changed. It's still going to want to sit on the cosmic horizon. Because you put in a black hole, the cosmic horizon is going to react and shrink. But they're going to react and shrink in the same way. The area of these two cosmic horizons is the same. Okay, You sort of put in a black hole in the interior of either uh, static patch. And you've entangled them together so that there's a wormhole now between them. Okay, So these cosmic horizons are still equal area. OK, the exterior extremization just gives you the area of the cosmic horizon. The interior extremization now, though, lands on the black hole bifurcate horizon, which I've denoted by the small blue circle here. 
So altogether, so that in the Penrose diagram is exactly this point over here, okay? So altogether, you get the area of the cosmic horizon plus the area of the black hole horizon divided by 4G Newton. And the entanglement wedge is a region between the two horizons. Uh, these are, again, answers that we would expect, okay? Let's compute the global entropy, the union of the two horizons. There you get zero, basically for the same reason as in the earlier pure de-sitter example. You extremize in the exterior, those surfaces annihilate and give you the trivial surface. Now it's important that you don't do the left interior extremization and the right interior extremization separately. If you did, you would have landed on a funny situation where you pick up an area of the black hole horizon when you do the left extremization, and then another factor of that when you do the right interior extremization. The point is that the extremization I'm talking about is really one single overall extremization, okay? Uh, I'm breaking it up into separate ones because in simple examples, you can do that and it's easy to see what's going on. But of course, if you have some non-trivial entanglement or spatial topology, then you need to do just a single extremization. And that shows you that then these two surfaces can annihilate. And you get that the entanglement wedge is the entire space-time, again, as you would expect, because you took the full microscopic theory. Okay, the monolayer theory gives the same answers. Uh, it needs to be slightly modified. The statement is that you don't only extremize between the cosmic horizons, you extremize between any set of horizons you might have. And in this case, you have a set of black hole horizons. So if you modify it by saying you extremize both between black hole and cosmic horizons, then you'll get numerically the same answers. Okay, those are some basic sort of consistency checks. We didn't get anything too crazy out of, out of this proposal, but the monolayer and bilayer theory seem to give the same sort of answer in, in these cases. So you can ask, as Mudasir did, why are you going on and on? Well, it's not what he has, but he has, why are you going on and on about bilayer versus monolayer if they give you the same answers? But there's a case where they don't, okay? It's not clear that the case where they don't is a reasonable thing to do. Um, it corresponds to considering a subregion on a single horizon. In ADS CFT, this is totally reasonable to consider a subregion of the ADS boundary. That's like considering a geometric subregion of the CFT. And uh, that, that, that's, that's a valid operation. We know what that means. But here, we don't expect, for example, that the microscopic theory has the same dimensionality of the cosmic horizon. So, Taking a piece of the horizon is a little weird. It's, a, it's somewhat similar to trying to chop up the internal space in ADS CFT, which people have tried to do. And if you take ADS 5 cross S5, you can ask about extremal surfaces anchored to the equator of the S5 at infinity and try to interpret them. Okay. There's no sharp statement about what this is. Um, but it's, if you, this feels a little bit more like doing that. So one should be careful. But it gives interesting uh, results, so I'm going to do it anyway. And it's going to distinguish the two proposals. So let's compute for the bilayer theory first. The bilayer theory, if I consider this small red region on the horizon, when I extremize either to the exterior or the interior, it's not going to want to go anywhere. It's going to sit right on the piece of the horizon, which you're considering. So the entropy as a function of size is going to grow at two times the size of the region you're considering. That's bad. <laughs> That's bad because if it continued that way, it would exceed the area of the cosmic horizon over 4G Newton. And we don't want that to happen because, uh, well, we like or believe we're trying to land on a central dogma-like picture, which says that the Hilbert space here only has area over 4G Newton degrees of freedom. If that's true, then you can't have more entanglement than area over 4G Newton. Okay, so this is threatening the central dogma. But there's a fascinating transition that happens, very simple to understand. As you go to larger than half the horizon size, then the interior extremization is allowed, that surface is allowed to flip around and come to the other side. Okay, the exterior extremization just um, doesn't change. It's still the region because it has a topological obstruction. It can't go past this thing. This is like another ADS boundary. It can't go past this. But this surface doesn't have a topological obstruction. It flips around to the other side. And now this area plus this area just gives you the full area of the cosmic horizon because they're complementary pieces of the cosmic horizon. So exactly at the halfway point, right when you're about to violate the central dogma, 
there's a transition and you get exactly area of 4G Newton for the entropy. I like to think about this as a lot like the island transition in the case of black holes. Now the physics uh, may not be related, but A, you come very close to violating this bound from the central dogma. And B, there is a transition and it happens at an order one fraction of the system size. In this case, it's exactly half the system size where a new saddle appears and the entanglement wedge now includes the entire interior, whereas before it didn't include any of the interior. I find that similarity somewhat compelling. That being said, you may worry that this is not, um, this is a weird curve for the entropy. In particular, it's not an ordinary curve from, from thermal physics, okay? Um, and we like to think of De Sitter as a thermal-like system. So you can ask, is this weird for a thermal system? The monolayer theory doesn't give you this curve. The monolayer theory gives you a curve you'd expect from thermal physics. It just linearly increases and saturates once you consider the entire system size. That's because just forget about what's going on in this interior region. The answer is what's drawn over here. It's just always the region of the horizon you pick. So the entropy is A over 4G times whatever fraction of the horizon you've chosen. So this increases linearly. That's an ordinary thermal curve. Okay, this is a great example because if it makes sense to do, it distinguishes the two proposals. But now I'd like to argue that even though the monolayer proposal gives you a thermal looking answer, that's not what you want actually. Um, well, I don't think that that's what you want. And to make the point, I want to say a few words about ADS CFT and black holes. Sorry, Edgar. I want to yeah. Ask about the distinction you make between one of them being something thermal and the other one not. I thought the the first one, which is increases and then flattens out after phase, it goes undergoes a phase transition, is the situation you get with the, when in in ADS when you have uh, the eternal black hole. So what is unphysical? What is non thermodynamic about that? Uh, um, that's my next slide. That's exactly my next slide. So we do expect uh, something yeah. like that, right? I mean, it's not against the intuition of thermodynamics. As a matter, it's fact, against the intuition. It's against the intuition of the thermodynamic limit. I mean, let, let me just jump to the next. Well, sorry, let me pause that. See if there are any other questions, and if not, we'll just get into it. But in short, in short, I, I basically agree with you. Okay. So good. So what's the point? Uh, the point is that the large end limit is not the same as the ordinary large volume or thermodynamic limit. Okay. They look like they're the same for a lot of things, but they're not the same. So what do I mean? Well, okay. There, my perspective on it, uh, is, is a particular one. The details aren't really necessary, but I think they're somewhat interesting that there is some pattern of higher form symmetry breaking in holographic CFTs that makes the large end limit look a lot like the thermodynamic limit. So what do I mean by that? Let's say you took your favorite holographic theory, let's say it's n equals four super Yang mills, and you put it on a spatial torus. So a spatial three torus, okay? Now, and you compute the thermal entropy of this theory on a spatial three torus. If the temperature is above the Hawking Pay transition temperature or above the deconfinement uh, uh, scale, then the answer for the entropy looks like this. Okay. This is a totally ordinary answer, but it's a little weird if you think about it, because this is the answer you would expect at infinite temperature. Okay. The answer at infinite temperature is always some extensive function. This is extensivity, that's all this is. But if you're not at infinite temperature, if you're at two times the Hawking page temperature, you could have had a whole series of sub-extensive corrections to this answer, but you don't, they're not there. Okay, in two-dimensional CFT, this is um, sometimes called the uh, extended range of validity of the Cardi formula. The fact that there can be all these corrections to the entropy, but they're not there, is a special thing about holographic CFTs, okay? So, and generic large end theories are not going to behave like this, all right? So that's sort of the sense in which I mean that um, the holographic theories kind of mimic a thermodynamic limit 
because they you know do some additional stuff to there's some additional magic there's some additional secret sauce that makes their answers look like infinite temperature answers okay so they're pretty good at mimicking them but as nima said they're not great they're not a they're not perfect i mean there's a pretty simple thing you can compute which is going to show you that you're not in the thermodynamic limit and it's precisely the entropy of some subregion uh, in the eternal black hole. So here we have a mixed state black hole. This is the ADS boundary. And you imagine computing the entropy of region R and taking increasingly large regions R. Okay, at some point you'll start feeling the black hole, you'll start feeling the thermal piece of the entropy. And then at an order one fraction of the system size, the surface is gonna snap. You're gonna get a union of two surfaces, one that is still anchored to the boundary and a disconnected one that sits right at the horizon of the black hole, okay? Now, this, again, in the strict sense of the thermodynamic limit, this is not uh, the type of answer that you expect. The thermodynamic limit is the large volume or large temperature limit. If you took the large temperature limit, that'd be like taking this black hole very, very large, so it sits near the ADS boundary. And then this transition is pushed to arbitrarily late times. You basically never see it. And the entropy curve will become exactly linear. So that's what I mean by saying that this is a thermal answer. This is what we expect in the thermodynamic limit. We, of course, call black holes thermal systems, but one needs to be careful. They're not thermal in that exact traditional sense. Um, and you know, which observable you're computing, sometimes the observable will look like it's exactly thermal, and other times it will tell you that it's not exactly thermal. So there's still a distinction between the large end limit at finite temperature and the true thermodynamic limit. Are there any questions about that? Sorry, Edgar, I think, I think I got confused. I probably misunderstood what you were saying. So uh, I thought the extended regime of validity in holographic theories has to do with large gap and not large n. So you need a large n to have something like the phase transition, but you need something like large gap to is that, am, am I wrong about that? I thought, I thought that was. Yeah, you need, you, yeah, you basically need large n and, well, by large gap, uh, I assume you mean that this uh, Hagedorn bound on the low lying density of states, not like the HPPS large gap. I mean, that may also work, but what's been shown is right. you have a Hagedorn exactly. bound on the exactly. Right. So, uh, yeah, so um, I, I, I guess I'm a little bit confused. Maybe, maybe I, I just misunderstood the, the conclusion. But you were saying, you said you you were, you were trying to make the point that the large n limit is not, it, it leads to phase transitions, but these phase transitions are very different compared to the thermodynamic standard large volume thermodynamic limit. Is that what the point was? Or yeah, yeah, you can take n free bosons, for example, and they're not going to have this structure. So it's important, for example, said another way, the large gap assumption, it's an assumption that the system is, well, it's not really the same as it being holographic, but it's some additional input that is going to help it um, look like it's in the thermodynamic limit. But it's still not going to be good enough because whatever you do over here, you're going to get this non-thermodynamic answer. Or rather, you know, it's an answer that's not exactly what you get in the thermodynamic limit, where the entropy should just increase linearly as a function of the system size, just by additivity. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other observables besides just the entropy density, which are good at um, making you look like you're in the thermodynamic limit. For example, famously, you can write the two point function, thermal two point function, by computing it in the BTZ black hole background for a two dimensional CFT. And you get the sum over images. And there again, you get an answer that's basically the same as you'd expect in thermodynamic limit. Um, the subextensive corrections, they're there, but they're sort of trivial. But anyway, what I want to say is here, this computation where you sort of pick up the area of the black hole horizon in an order one fraction of the system size, as Nemo was pointing out, is a lot like this transition here. In that sense, this transition is not, I think this was uh, his point, uh, um, but that's anyway, the point that um, I agree with, which is that once you saturate the area over 4G, that's not that weird a behavior. That's what's going on over here. Okay. 
All right, so that's a plausibility argument that this bilayer curve is not uh, a particularly weird thing to do. It'd be nice to have a model which actually reproduces it. Now, this is the sort of simplest toy model I could think of, uh, that, we, that, sorry, that we could think of um, that, that, that does this. So in the paper with uh, Lenny, we wrote down this uh, very simple two qubit model with a finite dimensional Hilbert space. It's the Heisenberg antiferromagnet. So these are just the uh, poly spins. And this model is of course simple enough to solve exactly. And you can, can compute the entropy at arbitrary temperature for zero qubits, one qubit or two qubits. Of course, at any temperature, the entropy of zero qubits is zero. So the curve starts off there. Let's look at the zero temperature case. The entropy of two qubits, because we're at zero temperature, it's just in a pure state, that's also zero. And the pure state that it's in is the spin singlet state. It's basically a bell pair. So if I trace out one of the qubits, I'm going to get log two worth of entropy. Okay, the infinite temperature answer is like the monolayer curve. It's like the ther uh, thermal answer. It's an exactly linear curve. And that just comes from additivity. Okay, One qubit gives you log two worth of entropy. Two gives two log two. If you had more, it would just increase linearly in that way. OK, now one might guess, well, here's a t equals 0 curve. Here's a t equals infinity curve. Maybe there's some intermediate temperature where this point lives right around here. Of course, you have to worry that you might fiddle with the entropy of one qubit. But this model actually has an SU2 symmetry, which preserves the density matrix of one qubit to be maximally mixed. So if you compute exactly, you find that at any temperature, the entropy of one qubit is log 2. And so then, as you vary the temperature, indeed, there's some temperature, it's approximately given by this formula here, where the curve is exactly horizontal from one qubit to two qubits. And of course, this curve is meant to look like the bilayer theory curve. Okay, this, uh, of course, we don't believe that this is a theory that's dual to the sitter space, but um, this curve is reproducible by doing things that, Sarah, was there a question? Oh no. Um, this curve is reproducible by doing things at finite temperature, just not infinite temperature. If you're ever at infinite temperature, you're going to recover an exactly linear curve. And Sitter space, we don't think, is a system at infinite temperature. We just think it's at finite temperature. Um, so this type of curve is plausible. And it would be great, of course, to actually have this curve come out of some microscopic model that you think might be relevant for Sitter space for other reasons. Because the other nice thing about this curve is it's a weird, it's, it's a somewhat weird, it's a pretty weird curve, okay? Uh, this curve is not hard to reproduce. Any system at infinite temperature will give you this curve. This curve is a lot harder to reproduce. I mean, not in this two qubit model, but if you actually had some real system, it's pretty hard to reproduce. Okay, um, basically out of time. So let me summarize and just talk about some future direction. Yeah. Uh, about this trial model, or to, and isn't the analog of A over 4G is 2? Because you have like two degrees of freedom. Um, uh, the, yeah, sort of, yeah. So the bilayer would be something like that goes linearly goes to 2 log 2 and then flat enough. Oh, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, there's 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 a funny thing. Good, 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 good. Uh, there's a funny thing, which is to reproduce this curve, um, even in this toy model, it sort of seems necessary to write down a system that has two times the area over 4G Newton degrees of freedom, but where half of those are always kind of dead qubits, which never contribute to the entropy. Um, that, yeah, that, that just seems to be a, a sort of, I don't know of a way to, to get this curve otherwise. For this curve, of course, you can write down a system with area over four G degrees of freedom, put it in infinite temperature and it'll look like this. But because this taps out at half the system size, in any qubit model, you're gonna have to write down a system which has twice the area over four G Newton degrees of freedom. I think that was your point, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That is, I would like to understand that better. Um, because yeah, it suggests that the central dogma is sort of slightly modified and darn area of 4G Newton degrees of freedom, it's two times area of 4G Newton degrees of freedom, but I, I don't really understand that yet. So in one sense, the entropy at the half is quantum and then at the end is classical or something. 
Yeah, uh, what, what do you mean by that? Like two qubits, uh, it should be the entropy shaft comes from the density matrix, uh, what is, at one comes from the entanglement. Well, you can think of it in both cases as entanglement. But then why the two qubits are not in a pure state? Well, they're entangled with uh, some other auxiliary system because they're at finite temperature. Ah, but then, no, well, but by themselves, I mean, they're in a density matrix and that's the entropy of two qubits. Well, if you're in a density matrix, you're not, I mean, it can, the density matrix can come either by thinking of it as like a classical thing or as coming from tracing out something that was quantum entangled with something else. I have what I have the two qubits and by themselves they're in a thermal density matrix that get the entropy of two, but then qubit one is entangled with qubit two that gives you the entropy at one, and they are both the same in some terms. I'm not sure here you can declare that the entropy of qubit one is entangled with qubit two. It again, it's at finite temperature. So there's some over there's some global pure state of four qubits, these two qubits and the purifying thermal field double partners. And you can just trace stuff out and compute density matrices for um, any given qubit or set of qubits that you want. So uh, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I, roughly speaking, yeah, you can maybe think about this as more of like a classical style entropy coming from a thermal thing. But I think uh, rigorously, I would call them all just some quantum entropies associated to some uh, density matrix for whatever subset you're considering. Okay, so let me just quickly summarize the, the first lesson is that the cosmological horizon, even though it seems similar, is actually very different than the black hole horizon. And the key point is that geometrically, it's as difference that it's a mini max surface instead of a maxi min surface. So it shouldn't enter into entropy computations in the same way. It doesn't naively work as an extreme or quantum extremal surface. But if you anchor things to the horizon, then you can land on the horizon area and its associated entropy and not lead to these entanglement wedge nesting violations. Okay, so that is the only way I know to get the horizon area in an entanglement computation and not violate entanglement wedge nesting. Some things I would like to understand better is, you know, of course, I said cosmic horizons are different than black hole horizons. But you can ask, well, can I anchor surfaces to the black hole horizon? This is a little bit more like the old, uh, you know, Tooth style holography, where you imagine the holographic degrees of freedom are right on the black hole event horizon. You don't need the ADS boundary all the way over there. So you can ask, what if I anchor surfaces to the black hole event horizon? Is that something that's reasonable? And I think you might be able to probe this in ADS CFT. Um, you know, it, it, it's, well, it's a bit sharper because it's about black holes. Those are always easier to handle than cosmic horizons. And you might hope to make progress on this by thinking about it in ADS CFT. Uh, a very difficult question that, uh, okay, I don't really know an angle uh, of attack, but I, I pointed out just to say that what I've done here is special, is that a general cosmology like the one we live in with a big bang and radiation domination and then, you know, cos positive cosmological constant domination in the future, is not really going to be encoded by a pair of horizons. If you think about holographic screens, et cetera, there isn't really a reason why a pair of horizons are enough to encode the entire space time. So, you, you know, it's a, a legitimate question of how encoding works there. And the thing I care about the most and, and, and would really like to understand is to find a microscopic model matching these features. In particular, reproducing this curve, which I tried to argue is a pretty uh, distinctive curve. Okay. So, you know, there are some models recently, Herman Verlinde and Lenny Soskin, for independent reasons, uh, have proposed that double scaled SYKs may be relevant for, for de Sitter space. So if there's some model like that, which is richer than the Heisenberg antiferromagnet, uh, it'd be nice to try and compute its entropy and see if it has this, uh, this sharp structure, this sharp transition at half the system size. That I think uh, would be incredible. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. And thanks for your attention. Are there any questions for Edgar? I have a question, Edgar. Uh, the, the, there was uh, Rafael who says, like, propose how to decide whether what is inside and what is outside by this wedge uh, construction. 
like looking at the light sheets of the food surface and see in which direction the light sheets are like contracting. So is that uh, how you proposal of monolayer is like similar to that or? So you you asking uh, how to think about the holographic screens in this context? Um, yeah, but also in the sense of like in the covenant entropy bond, the there is a notion of insight, and that insight is defined in terms of light sheets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, right. That's yeah. That's the same thing. So let's let's talk about that for a second. Uh, so here's a Penrose diagram, and. <clears throat> Okay, well, first of all, one thing to point out is if you use these light sheets and try and um, project the information to various regions, uh, the first statement is this upper triangle, its information does not want to be projected to either this horizon or that horizon. What do I mean by that? What I mean is the area of either of these horizons does not, via the covariant entropy bound, bound uh, the um, information of the stuff in here. So you can say, well, what the hell, then why are you saying that these horizons encode what's going on over here? Uh, the reason for that is, is a little bit more subtle. If you use these light sheets, what you can show is the following. The traditional way people use them was to take this upper triangle and project all the information to this holographic screen of future infinity. This is like the picture of DSCFT, okay? The holographic sc uh, screen is, lives up here. Analogously, this triangle here, its information can be projected to this scry minus. So th that's more like a DSCFT picture. But even in Raphael's early papers, he pointed out that there is another funny kind of holographic screen, which is you can take this triangle, which is really the relevant one for a particular static patch observer, and project this information to this horizon here. Okay, So that should sort of be enough to describe the experiences of this observer. But let me try and connect that now to the things I talked about here. This horizon is a holographic screen for this triangle. This horizon is a holographic screen for this triangle. So together, these two horizons cover a Cauchy slice in the past. And so in particular, they should also know about the future of that Cauchy slice. So while direct covariant entropy boundology won't tell you that this is encoded here and here, uh, there's a simple argument which says that, well, you cover what's in the past, and therefore you're going to cover what's in the future. A slightly more physical way to talk about it is you might worry that there's tons of stuff you can put up here, way more than e to the area over 4G Newton states that can fit up in this future region, and therefore you can't encode them by that small number of degrees of freedom. But actually, if you put stuff up here and evolved back, you would have a past singularity. That's sort of the time reverse of saying you put a bunch of stuff down here, you evolve forward, it's going to lead to a crunch. And recently, Raphael and Arvin uh, you know, turned this into a sort of sharper theorem um, via some you know, entropy violations showing that even if you sprinkle a light amount of thermal stuff arbitrarily far in the future, it will lead to a crunch in the past. So the fact that I fixed to global de Sitter uh, was key in saying two horizons can encode what's going on over here. That's why I said the more general cosmologies, this, this won't really work. If you have a Big Bang, you can put tons of stuff at the Big Bang, and it's unclear how to, how to encode them. So to come to your thing about inside and outside, I think that's just kind of determined by the region that's encoded by the cosmic horizon. Uh, I mean, I forget the terminology, but in that sense, I would say that this is the inside of this horizon, and this is the inside of that horizon. Thanks. Any other questions for Edgar? If not, let's thank Edgar again. Thanks, guys. This was fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Enjoy. Stay safe. Bye.